Jesus as they traveled around the region with his 12 disciples, and there were more that were with him. I hope you get that. One of the things we, we want to have is a, an accurate picture of what was going on. It wasn't like this silent thing where Jesus would get up and they would get up and just the 12 of them would go and very morose. He, there was a large following that would travel with Jesus around and there was 12 that were with him, his disciples. And even within that 12, there was a group that was actually his inner group that would go with him. But he would always go off, it sounds like, scripture tells us, he would go out and he would pray. And the way he prayed it was shocking to the men who heard it, these individuals. And it wasn't so much shocking that he had a consistent prayer life. Even today, the Jews did as they did in those days. They prayed three times daily. So the disciples, they weren't shocked that someone would pray so um, faithfully. They were shocked at the content. They were shocked at the content of his prayers because his prayers were different. They weren't formulaic. They didn't have something that you would say this and that, although Jesus did. As a Jewish individual, we would assume, pray the three prayers daily, but on his own, he would go off and he prayed these very intimate, open, transparent prayers where Jesus would actually wrestle with real issues, real concerns with God. And just as a footnote, I don't think they should have been that shocked by some of this because um, my favorite prayer in the Bible would have been in what they were very familiar with in Jeremiah. The Jeremiah's complaint, it's called, where he calls God. Anybody remember what he calls God? A liar. That Jeremiah calls God a liar. He says, you lied to me. You said things were going to turn out good for me. But every day I wake up and more horrible things are done to me. He says, I wish, this is Jeremiah's prayer. I relate to this prayer sometimes. Jeremiah said, uh, I, I wish you would have killed me at childbirth. And he goes, that's not enough. That doesn't accurately express how I hate my life right now. He goes, I wish you would have killed the doctor who delivered me as I died at childbirth. He goes, no, that's not quite good enough either. He goes, I wish you would have killed the doctor, killed me, and also struck dead the man who went to my dad and said, good news, because it wasn't. He goes, this, this is the type of, and I say that, and I, this is my favorite prayer to read, Jeremiah's complaint, and I read this, and people are shocked by it, and yet I say, man, that is ac actually the more mature I've been and, and when I say by mature, right, I mean, the more I understand the heart of God, this has marked my prayers with him sometimes much more in seasons than, oh, everything is great. Quite often, my prayers have been, I don't understand, this hurts so much, I wish I could die. I wish that everything, I, I understand all this stuff, but I wish it could be taken away from this situation. I wish it wasn't that. And so Jesus' prayer was even more intimate than the ones they were familiar with out of Jeremiah and out of Isaiah. They were intimate in such a way they had never heard, so the disciples approached Jesus. And they asked them, they said, well, teach us to pray like, like that. But, but really, how to read that is not saying, teach us one more formula to pray. They had many formulas they had to pray. He, they were saying, we want, we, we, we want that. We want what you have. How do we get that? And so Jesus' response was amazing. Because even today, as we're going through Matthew and we're going to sit in the Lord's Prayer, we've been there three weeks, well, we may be there another three, depending on how we go through this, but even today, the Lord's Prayer is often taught as some instruction manual. We'll make sure when you pray that it contains this, and then you move to this, and you move to this. And I'm not here to say that there's not any value in that, but I am here to say it is not my belief that that is how Jesus was intent upon giving it to them. It was not an instruction manual. It was an invitation to intimacy, and we talked about that for the last two weeks. An invitation to do what? And this is where theologically I had to go out and check because this is such a radical thing that I didn't want to get this wrong because to get this wrong would be to lie about God. And I'm not going to lie about God. To lie about God is the most evil thing you can do because your identity, your purpose, everything about you is shaped by what you believe about God. And so I had to double check this and triple check this because it is so radical. It was an invitation into what? Jesus in this Lord's Prayer He's delivering invitation to participate in the same relationship that Jesus himself has with the Father. There's a fly buzzing around. That Jesus has with the Father as what? As his child. The Son of God was saying, pray to him, what? Our Father. And, and we, we can't just go past that because, oh, flies after me. 
We can't just move past that because we're so close to it that we miss it. Pull back and look at human history and understand the radical change in nature in the relationship that Jesus was telling us. He's saying, listen, you can come to him as I do, as his child, and this was radical. Because it doesn't just change, if you think of him as the father, we need to understand it doesn't just change the way we view God, it also necessitates a change in the way we view ourselves. We are no longer under judgment, or we're no longer under some hyper-focus of you have messed up. He's not an angry... Now, some of you, and I've said this in the days past, I am sorry that that's what you think of when you think of a father. I, I'm sorry that's the dad that you had, that when I say he's like a father, you think, oh, I don't want another one of those. He's not like that. In fact, I would say, if you feel that way, everything your heart has longed for that your earthly father would have been should direct you toward God. He is the father your heart has craved for. He's the dad you've always won. It was radical when Jesus said, our father. Now, later in his ministry, that was earlier in his ministry, when they came up to him and they asked, later in his ministry, Jesus gives this longest uninterrupted message that's recorded in Scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. And in that, he takes what he had told the disciples in this pri more private session, and he gives it to everybody in the Lord's Prayer. But the message, again, is contained within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus describing what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so when you put it... The Lord's Prayer, into this greater context, there's some truth that comes out of this thing, as he says, pray this way. Because the entire Christian life, our identity, and our primary passion, well, they're the results. All the results of, of living the Christian life, all the results of, of our identity found in God, all the results, everything that comes from the Christian life, lived the way it should be, well, they're actually described within this one little prayer. I believe that. I believe that one of the things we talk about Jesus' deity, we talk about his divinity, we talk about his righteousness, his holiness, his compassion, righteous anger. One of the things I think we skip over is his intelligence, his intellect. Jesus, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to say it without it sounding flippant, but he was, he was a genius, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know human words to talk about what this would be except to say... Everything he said had, had this purpose to it. And the Lord's Prayer is a synopsis of the Christian life. From, from approaching him as our Father, and we talked about last week, and this idea of hallowing, to knowing his character so deeply, to knowing him so deeply, the Christian life, that our attitude, our attitude towards him reflects his absolute goodness towards us. When you realize the goodness, see, we don't we talk about that enough. We talk about his righteousness, his holiness, and I uh, absolutely, those need to be understood or you do not understand the hallowed aspect. But if you only understand God is holy and God is he's far and he's distant, and you never come to understand his absolute goodness for you, his heart for you, then he's always at a distance. He'll never come close because you will never allow him. You will run at his presence. And I said last week, how you feel about his name, how you feel about being in the presence of someone, that reveals what you think about someone. There are people, at, not in here, but there's people out there that when I see it Safeway, I kind of avoid them. I know, right? You thought I was just like Jesus. But Jesus, I'm sure there was times he was tired. Right? But I'm like, oh, I don't really know if I want to have time because I know this is going to be a 30-minute conversation and they're over sharers and all, whatever. I don't hate anybody, but there's times I just don't have the energy for it, right? But that's what their name comes when I think. I'm like, okay, I got to get my best game face on. Then there's other names I hear that, that I've, I shared last week that are so near and dear to me that just the thought of them just makes me understand their, their goodness, how much I love them, their, their concern, their compassion. And how you feel about being in the presence of God will reveal, and I mean now and later, but now how you feel about the name God reveals how you actually believe him to be. His absolute goodness, hallowed be thy name. I said last week, and I'll say this until the day I'm dead, 
The ultimate goal of the Christian life is to pursue God. The ultimate goal of the Christian life is to know God more fully. It says that joy is found in the presence of Jesus. This is where joy is found. Well, I'm a pretty selfish guy. I'm addicted to the joy I find, the peace I find, the purpose I find when I'm in the presence of Christ. So I just want to move closer to him. And this is the ultimate goal is to know God more fully. And, and I said this last week, and I'll continue to say it, and I will probably argue with you on your time if you want to. It's not, as some people have taught us, to pursue the benefits of God. It's not. It, our primary purpose, and I said that because people might misunderstand me. Don, are you saying that there's not benefits to God that are winsome and attractive and desirable? I never said that a day in my life. And I've said this to some of you who misunderstand me. I cannot argue with the voices in your head. I can only tell you what Scripture says. So if you think I've said that, well, that's somebody else, not me. In fact, I told you it says, seek ye first what? The kingdom, and then what? Yeah, all things, everything else will be added. All the things that you go, I like that, I want that, great. Seek ye first the kingdom, let the gift giver decide what he's going to give you, because his will, his knowledge, his purpose is better than you. And I said last week, when I did a bunch about Calvin and Hobbes, and if you weren't here, well, you missed it, it was beautiful. <laughs> Calvin Hobbes is awesome. And I talked about licensing, and I talked about merchandising, yeah, on a Sunday. And I said some pastors today... Some teachers, well, they've, they've licensed and merchandised God to present them in such a way for their own profit that it is not God. And that's, that's never going to lead you into wanting to participate in the fullness of God. What it does, it distracts you from God. It will take you somewhere else. And I'll make my point here a little bit. But I'll say the purpose of the Christian life is to move so close to Christ that we begin to be what? Transformed to look like who? Like Christ. I'll say it again. The purpose is to move so close to Christ that we begin to be transformed by Christ to look like Christ, which brings us, these are foundational teachings that are found in the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, some of you be like, oh, that's no big deal. Some of you have heard this before are going to be like I was. This is amazing stuff. This is revolutionary, radical stuff. We're basically talking about the foundations of the Christian walk. And the next foundational truth regarding a citizen of the kingdom of heaven can be found here. So I think I have Matthew 6.10. Is that what I have, Gabe? What do I have? Already? Well, we'll come to that in a minute then. Because that's, I just didn't put it in. That's on my fault. So forget about that. Forget I ever said that. All of that. Let's start over. No. The number one proclamation made by Jesus during his three-year ministry was that the kingdom of God had arrived here and now. One of my pet peeves is um, people who are always talking about getting out of here. I understand the pull. The older I get, the more I, I, I hate the way things look, the, the more I see pain. I now understand um, why all old people want to get out of here. Your body's failing. Death and decay is the destiny of everybody this side of the veil. I get that. I don't like it. And as I see people in evil and people getting hurt, I understand the desire. However, what I want to tell you is this. To talk about the kingdom of God, the benefits of God, and the, the closest, the intimacy, the authority, the power, to say that is one day off in the future is absolutely inaccurate. That the kingdom of God, Jesus said, was ushered in with his arrival on earth. His number one proclamation was the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. And he said that that kingdom would be brought about not by political reformation, but by personal transformation. And as I read that, I thought I better make a, a statement here, uh, which is this. That the world is transformed as who is transformed? Us. That my world is transformed, my kids, my community, my, my church, my marriage. My world is transformed as I am transformed. Spencer hinted at earlier, though, and we talked about it some at a group I was at yesterday, which is Paul makes it very clear that we are ambassadors on this shore, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Did I make that up? I need the wise in here because I'm going to say some things. Did I make it up that we are ambassadors? 
We are sent from our king. Ambassadors should always then cast a vote that their king would tell them to cast. Am I making that up? No. Oh, it's not quite as many people getting involved now. So I'll say it again. In the way the government is set up, if you are an ambassador, the king doesn't really care about the way you wish things would be. The king tells you to vote on whose behalf? His. His. So let me talk to you about voting. We are in a political season, and I honestly, here's what I will say, I'm not that interested in hearing arguments about stuff, so let me put it this way. There are, forget about faces, there are issues starting at the public, starting at the local, and moving its way up. There are issues where God's commands, God's desires, and God's priorities, in my opinion, are very clearly contrasted between two parties. Would you guys agree, either side? So what I would suggest all of you do, if you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is vote on the issues in the way that Scripture has revealed God's character and priorities to be. How's that? I won't lose my tax-free status on that, will I? Well, we're taxed. I won't, but my profit, not for profit status, if I tell you guys that I do believe those people, and I used to say this, I used to go, I'm apolitical, and then my brother Scott said, well, then you're an idiot. And I said, okay, well, all right, I'm, okay, I get that. I receive that, right? Because politics is actually the way the world works, and we have an opportunity for us to represent Christ, and that's all I'm going to say on that. But I would encourage you guys to get involved and then honestly understand this. Either side that you vote, we live in a world that doesn't make sense, don't we? Yeah. Your vote isn't going to make the world make sense. But when I stand before God, I want him to know I cast my vote as an ambassador. Now, for those of you who have been here four years and those of you who know me forever, is that the most I've ever talked about politics? Absolutely. So now let's get back to this. Because too many of you, this is what I like to do, yell at you. Too many of you think the world is going to be changed by your vote. Too many of you prioritize political reformation over personal transformation. You are wrong. The personal transformation is what is required, what is brought about by the kingdom of heaven residing within you. It's going to happen as people accept it, and this is very basic. Look, he made an invitation, an intimacy with the Father. Personal transformation, the kingdom of God coming here now to my house, to your house, and in fact, guess what? To sweet home, to the world, whatever. Play it out as far as you want to play it out. That kingdom happens as people accept Jesus' invitation to partake in a personal relationship with God, to approach him as their Father. I cannot overstate the importance of such a thing. This is amazing. It is beautiful. And I want to say on behalf of pastors, of believers who have misrepresented God, who have driven you away from God your whole life, please forgive us. They did not represent what Christ came to do. And for those who go, oh, you need to hit people harder. I'm going to quote Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come to condemn. I came to. But if you want to participate in the benefits of a relationship... You must value the priorities of that relationship. And Jesus said, man, my people will look a certain way. They're going to act a certain way because they are different. And how are they different? They're in a personal relationship. And the Holy Spirit, well, he seals that. Jesus, the Son of God, and also God himself, don't ask me to explain it, was inviting us into this very personal, intimate relationship where we would not only, this is amazing, this is, now we're getting into the gist of it. He was saying, not only will you be children of God, but you will be brothers and sisters of who? Oh, who, what did you say? Of Jesus Christ. You see, we know that we're brothers and sisters in here, but a lot of us want to shy away from really the big deals, the stuff he has said in his own words, because we're like, I don't know, I don't, that may be too much. I want to stay in my comfort zone. I don't, well, I don't know, Don. He himself said this, go to Mark 3.35, Gabe. <laughs> Whoever does God's will is my what? My brother, my sister, my mother. And you go, well, he didn't say father. <laughs> well, got one of those, doesn't he? 
He says, so do you. But whoever does what? Whoever does what? Whoever does God's will. Jesus described us as being his brother and sister. He is our brother. This is amazing. Jesus Christ is our brother in Christ. Don't ask me to explain it. Jesus himself said, though, that he is our brother, we are his brother and sister. But he described, and this is where, hey, this is, I'm gonna, this is hard, you have to listen. Jesus described how you get to know who's in the family. He said, you, you, you're not all in. Not everybody who thinks you're in with me are in with me. Not all of you think that you're in, invited to the, uh, the cookout. Not all of you are. Not everybody here who thinks that you're my brother is, and there's a way to know it. Because the pursuit of God has a natural result, result, and and here's what it looks like. It's not about a moral thing. Jesus did not come to make good, bad people good. That's been misrepresented. We think, oh, now, guess what? If you follow the teachings of Jesus, well, very naturally. If you don't jump off a building, you won't be negatively impacted by the law of gravity. If you don't do certain things that Jesus said don't do, the natural laws of what you sow, you will reap, they're not going to negatively impact you. You can do all the things Jesus talked about your marriage, about relationships, about finances, and your life will be positively impacted because he set up the world. This is the way it works. These are natural laws. But do not be confused. 30 years ago, I gave the first message I ever gave, and I haven't changed much since. The message was entitled this, You Can Save Your Marriage Without Saving Your Soul. That's 30 years ago. It's still in my heart that people come to the Bible like a self-help book, that people treat things. In fact, I would say most of us don't even go to the Bible. We just try to live moral lives, and we say, I must be a believer. And Jesus goes, that's not how it works. Let's break this down. The pursuit of God has a natural result when I say, yes, I want a relationship with you. I want to be your child. I want to take Jesus up on his invitation. The Holy Spirit sets up home inside of you, which means something very specific that I want to get you guys, and I've said in the years past, and it's a huge deal. Heaven is defined by where who is. God is where heaven is. It's not this, where God goes, heaven follows. God brings heaven down. He did it, he did it in the Exodus. Man's place, God's space. We've talked about this. The temple, man's place, God's space. We talked about this. But then as your grandmother said, as I say all these years, you are correct. You are now the temple. God's space, man's place. He lives within us with the Holy Spirit. So we carry within us what? Heaven. Heaven goes with me, goes with you wherever you go if you have the Holy Spirit. If you've accepted his invitation, go, yeah, I want to be a part of this family. God's kingdom, though, has come to you. And there's some ramifications, Jesus says, of that. Natural results of such a life. Natural results of having heaven reside within you. It means, Jesus says, that his will will be done in your life in the same way as it is done in heaven. Think about that. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer up until that point. We'll do it again later. See how beautiful this is. Say, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed. Now listen. He's describing the kingdom life. Thy kingdom. So come where? Where? Here. So that what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please, don't extend it further than what he's trying to say. It will happen when you yourself are transformed. Meaning the beauty of it is saying this. Those of us who carry heaven with us, those of us have the Holy Spirit residing within us, those of us who are children of God, we will do his will in the very same way that when he speaks it in heaven, it occurs. When he speaks into your life, what do you do? His will. It will be done in your life in the same fashion. Because as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, well, heaven resides within you. And the word for God's will is thelema. Thelema. Do we have that up? I don't even know at this point what I have anymore. Thank you. Thelema. And here's what it means. The Greek word used for his will means God's preference. And let's break, isn't that beautiful? 
God has a preference for what you do as a believer. We've now moved into, I'm talking to people who absolutely are children of God. He has a preference for what you should do. God has a desire for you. God wants you to pursue, and this is my favorite, what God has in mind. He wants you to do these things. This is his will, his desire to pursue what God has in mind. And so what is God's will for us? What is his desire for us? What does God have in mind for us? Generally speaking, that's what people ask me all the time. Believers, well, what am I supposed to do? What does God want for me? We argue over God's will all the time. Well, Scripture tells us that God actually has two things. That God has two types of will, two things in mind, two desires for us. And both of these can be found in Romans 12, 1 through 2. So look, therefore, this is Paul. I urge you, brother, again, I love it, right? Now you get it. We're all in the same family here. We're all the same dad. We have the same brother. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, this is a family meeting, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove, test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, you might have missed some stuff, but what is the goal of the Christian life? According to Paul, he says this, Our pursuit of God should result in our prioritizing God in everything. He says, what is your ultimate? You guys, you break it down. I do not like the fact that in 21st century Western America, but here, I do not like the fact that at Sweet Home Life Point, here, most of you come with the idea, you'll say things about, well, that was good worship today. I didn't like worship today. Oh, we didn't have worship today. And you're always talking about what? You're talking about music. You're talking about music. Is it not true that in America, when we start talking about worship at church, most of us are referring to whether or not we like the music? First of all, I don't care if you don't like the worship. We're not worshiping you. That it's supposed to be a gift we give who? It's supposed to be to God we're worshiping. It's supposed to be us doing that. But more than that, you've seen that I stumble and I bumble as I try to lead us into understanding that everything is a Christian. Everything should be an act of worship. So today, communion should have been an act of worship. That I say, if we get together and there's no music, um, and some people have gone, I really like music. Me too. But it shouldn't be, oh, I don't feel the same, because then our music has become an, an idol. So we pray. A couple weeks ago, uh, Spencer wasn't feeling well enough to sing, so he was over there. So I, I did a couple things. I took the opportunity to mock Glenn. I like doing that. Right? He was sick. But more than that, uh, I make the, somebody goes, well, uh, I noticed the pastor didn't cut his message short. And I was like, nope. The commitment I have is around 10, 15. I'll try to get you out of here. That's it. If I have more time to talk, we're going to use it. But I make these bumbling steps to show you guys, try to just demonstrate that everything we do is worship. And if we don't have music, well, we're going to pray. If we don't have this, I'll get down and talk. We, everything becomes an idol to us. And Jesus, God, or Paul is saying the number one pursuit, that our pursuit of God should result in our prioritizing God in everything. Your life becomes your form of worship. When I was growing up, I had the opportunity to have um, 80s coaches in football and wrestling. 80s coaches were better than me and those of us. We're too busy having to go, I mm, hope you guys don't get mad and hope your parents don't call me, Right? My dad never called my coach. My dad never called my teacher. You know, if my teacher said, so one time Larry Johnson brought me in as the vice principal, and he, uh, he waited till we were in uh, PE, because all I had on was those thin, remember those thin 80s running shorts? And you remember the days when you had to wear a jock strap as a guy because they'd even check? Remember those days, Chris? Right? So I had nothing between me and the world except a thin nylon strip. And Larry Johnson calls me in, and he brings out the two-handed wiffle ball paddle. And he says this to me, he goes, hey, he says, uh, I'm supposed to call your parents, you want me to do that? And I said, uh, Mr. Johnson, if we could just keep this between the two of us, I'd appreciate that. And he did for years. Nowadays, what did teachers get from their kids all the time? 
Why do I tell my mom? Right? Why do I tell my dad? That's, a, that's free. That's, I don't know if that's in the scripture. That's just Don's pet peeve of the day. But my point was 80s coaches were cool. But here's what my coaches told me. Norm Davis, every time you walk in the wrestling room, what does it say? Norm Davis wrestling room. Norm Davis told us growing up that prioritize your life this way. Faith first, family second, sports third. Norm Davis was wrong. You see, he had it right, but it was misphrased because if a citizen of the kingdom of heaven doesn't put, he doesn't put God first, because if you do, then what you say is this, well, I, I, the first tithe went to God, um, so I gave him uh, 10% or whatever you choose to do, so then what are you free to do with the rest of your check? Whatever you want. No, you're not. No, you're not. Every check you write, every dollar you spend, you spend as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm saying you ought to be doing it in the way that pleases God. Is that, un, is that right? Did I make that up? So what I would say is, the way you write checks, the way you use your money, ought to reflect the person of Jesus Christ. It ought to be what he prioritizes. It ought to be how he lived. Some of you don't understand that Jesus was the perfect representation of the Father in this world. Did I make that up? No. Jesus is the perfect representation. Your money, all of this. No, everything you do should reflect God's heart. So what I say is this. Do not put God first. Put God in the center of what? Put God in the center of your relationship. Put God in the center of your sexuality. Put God in the center of whatever you do. Everything has God, his heart, his thoughts, his emotions, his behaviors. Everything. Why? Because possessing God's heart is his first desire for you. What is God's will for everyone? What is his general will that you would be transformed into looking like Jesus Christ? That your heart would resemble the heart of Christ? That your heart would resemble God's? You guys, we get so involved. And what is my will for this? Well, God, Paul says, very clear, that his number one will is that you would be transformed. Transformed into the image of who? Christ. Transformed. It's actually a return to our original calling. I've said this. This is huge theology. This idea, it's our original God-given vocation. Our first parents were given in the garden was to live in such a way that they gave God's heart to the world. God's thoughts, God's emotions, God's behaviors were reflected back to the world. And we've said to act as angled mirrors. N.T. Wright, a smart guy, said, because when you live your life that way, then your life becomes this form of worship and praise you give back to God. Paul's not reinventing anything. Paul is saying we're called to go back to our original plan. To do what? Well, to have God's heart. It's the life we've been called to. We were created in his image. You guys, we were designed for this stuff. We were designed for this purpose. Some of you know the story as Jesus is going around and people wanted to trap him and they said, what about taxes? What about taxes? We're, we're called to give taxes to Caesar. We're overtaxed. We're hypertaxed. All of this stuff. And Jesus did not have a coin, so he asked for somebody to give him a coin. And do you remember what he did with the coin? He said, he picked it up and he said, uh, whose image is on it? And whose image was on the coin? Caesar. So he says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But then he says something that we skip. He says, but give unto God what is God's. Now think about what he's saying. He's saying, if the image on the coin is Caesar's, it marks the fact this is Caesar's. The image on something defines who it belongs to. Whose image is on us? He said we were designed in his image. He's simply saying... This is who you are. You were designed for this. This is where your purpose is. You were designed to reflect my heart to the world. Give to God the things that are God's. We belong to God. So his first desire for us is to be transformed, to return to our original vocation, to have his heart, his thoughts, his emotions, display his behaviors, guiding not the first thing we do, but everything we do, guiding everything we do, that's the ultimate form of worship. That is God's preference. Is it not for us? Is that God's greatest desire for us? Is that not what God has in mind about us? Absolutely it is to have his heart. But that's not where it ends. 
Because let's be honest, as we each navigate life, we're all confronted by a myriad of decisions, are we not? It doesn't just end there. I, I, I remember we were, uh, we were going through in corrections one time, juvenile corrections, and we're going through this training course on how to take down violent men, right? And I had this, other, this guy over here, and he's sitting there, and he refuses to participate. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, I don't believe in this. Jesus has my back. I'm like, well... I'm not going to ask for you to have mine in a bad situation. Because there's going to come a time and a place that we're going to have to roll with some angry men. And, and, and this idea, though, that, oh, I'm just going to stop. It, it, God has transformed me, and now I have nothing else to do, is a pie-in-the-sky idea, is it not? It's not pragmatic. Each of us are confronted every day, every season of our life, with a myriad of decision, decisions. Now, I can say, most of them are easily navigated as you just follow God's heart. Most of them aren't these life and death decisions you make. They're so simplistic. What would Jesus do is not a bracelet. It's, it's actually a decision-making metric. If you say, I'm going to do this in my life, and it's not something that the heart of Jesus ever had, and you have to jump through a myriad of philosophical and theological gymnastics and use another pastor and this pastor and this movement to justify what you're going to do with your life, you are wrong. What would Jesus do is the answer to, to 90% of our issues. And I just made that stat up. I would say, I have a watch. Is it, is it a gold watch? It's a gold-colored watch, right? I like it. It goes with my, um, I think this is salmon. I've been told it's, is it just pink? Yeah. Whatever. I, I, I am a sensitive man, Rick. Shut up. Um, I actually think it goes well, though, so I have it. But my point is this. I have a watch. God has given you his heart. God has given you his thoughts. God has given you behaviors. Most of the time... You know what to do. It'd be like wearing a watch and then asking your dad every time for the time. What's the time? I gave you the instrument. I gave you the instrument. What's the time? You have Most of our decisions are made by simply saying, I possess the heart of God. I know the will of God in this matter to act like Jesus. You want the time? Look at the watch. You want to do? Look at Jesus. But there are often decisions that loom larger, like starting a church in the middle of a pandemic. I didn't know what to do with that, where God seemed to be calling us in a, in a direction. Some of you were involved with that. Well, whatever God is calling you to act, to move down a path. But the only way you will be able to discern God, and I'm telling you this, God has specific wills. He has a general will for us to be transformed, but he has a specific will for you in some of these events in your life where you are sitting there going, I feel like God is calling me to do something. He's calling me to do this, but I can tell you this. The only way you will be able to discern God's preference, his desire, what he has in mind for you in these very specific instances is also to possess his heart. You see, you do not have the ability to discern God's true desire for you specifically if you do not possess his heart by knowing him truly. You just don't. And you will argue with me. And all I can come back with is that is not how Jesus portrayed it. That is not how God displayed it. And you'll tell me all these things. And I can say, if you're not living by that, I don't know what to tell you. Look at the, the I think I have Romans 2. The only way is to have surrender to this process of transformation. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, get that? You see how it works? Only after you've been transformed. Only after you've allowed God to do his will in your life generally, which is for you to surrender, to go, I want to know you. I have nothing on this thing. Wherever you take me, transform me. Only then you will be able to test and to prove, take away the app. Test and prove is a better way of the way it translates. What God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. Two wills. One, general will. All to be transformed. Two, these decisions you have to make. But only if you've done the first and you're actively in the program will you know the second. You won't know how to do these things if you don't know who he truly is. How do you know God's will? 
The word for test and approve is a Greek word that I won't bother you with the pronunciation of it, but it was a word used within the marketplace. To test and approve is one word that was used when they were referring to examining coins to ensure they were not counterfeit. You want to know God's true will? They use a marketplace word that's not counterfeit. You need to know one thing first, who God truly is, and to be transformed by his heart. You see, how do you know if it's God's will? I'll say it again. Does it fit with his heart? Does it look like Jesus? Far too many false teachers have built huge empires built upon teachings that don't resemble Christ because they don't even know God's heart. And if you don't know God's heart, you won't be able to discern God's will, no matter how spiritual you think you are. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name, and Jesus will say to them, I never knew you, because you never knew me. You never knew me, so I never knew you. Don't bring to me your spiritual conquest. Don't talk to me about the way you pray. Don't talk to me about your revelation. You didn't know me. So no matter how spiritual you think you are, but the good news is, if you possess God's heart, and that's your decision-making metric, well, you'll be blessed. Look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Did we just talk about that? And lean not on your own understanding. Did we just talk about that? In all your ways, submit to him. Did we just talk about that? And he will make sure that you only choose straight paths. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. And he will make your path straight. God does not come to you on these individual decisions and say, A or B, Chris, get it right, or you're hosed. We live that way, though. We think, I've got to get this right. Do you possess his heart? Are you trying to do his will? Do you want how the, what he wants for you? Well, he will make your paths straight. He's going to make it work out for you. Romans 8, 28. For you know that all things work together for good to those who love and are called according to, his pur according to whose purpose? Get rid of your stinking agenda because you don't even have a chance. If that's what you're doing, only if the priorities of heaven are the same priorities which are evident in you, because doing the will of God is foundational to our faith. So let's do the Lord's Prayer and end with that again. Do we have that up there where we end with it? Our Father, you say it with me, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your world starts with you. Two wills. He wants you to know him fully. He also wants you to trust him completely. You'll never manage to make the right decisions on these myriad of decisions if you don't know him first. But the good news is, if you know him, he will always put his desires for you first and make his path your path, which is always straight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for every good gift. Thank you for the greatest gift of all, which is a relationship offered to you. As always, with such passion comes the potential for hurt feelings. And so I would ask that any hurt feelings that might have come up, if I punch through people's belief or theology, if it's correct, that I would ask you to fill it with knowledge of you and your grace and ask them to lean not on their understanding but into your heart. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.